Houston. Welcome to uh, the University of Houston. Anyway, I am uh, Jonathan Slapen. I'm a professor in the political science department here, uh, and also I direct the Center for International Comparative Studies, and this event is co-sponsored by uh, our, uh, ourselves, uh, as well as um, the, the Faculty Senate of the University of Houston, and uh, uh, the Vice Provost Office has graciously provided some coffee and uh, a little bit of snacks. Um, so, uh, we also have with us on our panel um, uh, Mark Wynn, Vice President of the, uh, uh, the Dallas Federal Reserve, uh, Bent Sorensen, a professor in the UH Economics Department, Pablo Pinto, who is also a professor in the UH Political Science uh, Department, um, and Jaime Ortiz, our Vice Provost of uh, global, strat uh, global Strategies and Studies. Is that correct now? Um, thank you. Uh, we also have in the audience the uh, General Consul of Greece, Mr. Uh, Papin Nikolaou. Is that Papin Nikolaou? Papin Nikolaou. Oh, thank you. Um, and a, uh, our, a congressional, uh, a U.S. congressional candidate. Uh, we're going to parse the discussion in basically three sections. The nature of sovereign state debt, the single currency union, and the way it affected the distribution of wealth among it, and finally, what Greece moved, uh, how Greece ended up moving in this type of situation within the eurozone, and how Greece can get out from this situation, according to your opinion. These are the three things we want to catch, and you can elaborate on those for several minutes. Okay. Well, it's uh, good to be addressing all of you, uh, even though I can't see you or hear you. Um, I would like to begin with a mental experiment. Imagine that in 2008, in the fall of 2008, when uh, Lehman Brothers crashed and along with it the whole financial system of uh, the West, in a sense, uh, collapsed and required uh, the immediate uh, um, intervention by governments and central banks in order to be refloated. Imagine what would have happened if uh, the United States of America, structured like the Eurozone, Let's uh, focus in on some state, and let me use the, state, the great state of Nevada as an example. I'm, saying, I'm using the metaphor of Nevada because in terms of population, it's quite similar to Ireland. And also, in terms of its economy, it too was booming prior to 2008, on the basis of um, uh, construction, real estate, uh, and financial services. These were the two boom areas of Nevada, not too dissimilar to the great boom of uh, the Irish um, miracle of the 2000s. Uh, additionally, you had very low corporate taxes, like in, in, in Ireland, and you also had, therefore, uh, an influx of uh, capital that was seeking low tax rates, um, plentiful labor supply, and a very friendly business culture. Now, if in 2008, after the collapse of the banking sector, and at the same time of, of course, the real estate sector. The state of Nevada had to foot the bill for saving the banks of Nevada and at the same time to pay for the unemployment benefits of the construction workers that lost their jobs as the real estate sector and the construction sector of the state of Nevada collapsed. If that were the case, and the state of Nevada not only had to pay for unemployment benefits as well as bank recapitalizations, but on top of that, it didn't have a central bank of its own, and it did not have a federal uh, reserve backing its banks, and instead the state of Nevada had to go to the international markets to borrow in order to 
A for the, the banks as well as for the increased uh, social security payments, you can imagine what would have happened. No one would want to lend to the state of Nevada. The state of Nevada would go bankrupt. As it did, would, it would have to go to Washington DC or to the IMF or the combination of the two, uh, cap in hand, begging for a bailout loan by which to bail out the banks and do something about the burgeoning deficits. And furthermore, if that were the case, it's more likely than not that the IMF would uh, uh, respond by extending a loan facility, but on condition of very harsh austerity that would crash whatever is left of, or whatever was left of the state of Nevada. And then the place would become um, essentially a great exporter of uh, humans, like Ireland was, uh, or in the case of Greece, uh, a place where uh, only depravity survives for a very long time. Now, of course, this is not what happened to the state of Nevada, thankfully. And the reason why it didn't happen in the state of Nevada was because the United States of America, the dollar zone, has a rational architecture, unlike the Eurozone. What happened in the state of Nevada was that you had a banking union, so the banks of Nevada were saved by the FDIC, Federal Reserve, centrally, uh, and the unemployment benefits were footed, the bill was footed by the whole of the union. So you had the surplus states uh, through an automated mechanism known also as the IRS, income tax, paying uh, disproportionately for the deficit states unemployment benefits and social security. These are the shock absorbers that the proper monetary union has and it is the reason why the United States of America, even though it faced a very significant crisis after 2008, 2009, 2010. Nevertheless, it managed to um, emerge from it much more, much earlier than the Eurozone did. The Eurozone still hasn't emerged from recession and deflation. The United States did. It's not that the United States doesn't have problems, but at least no state of the United States of America is being treated as a failed state, and no state has a population that is in desperation as a whole, independently of whether they are better off or worse off, and no state in the United States is being discussed as a possible um, uh, how say, amputee, uh, somebody to be amputated from the Union. So it's quite clear that the Eurozone uh, was never designed to sustain the earthquake of the, the 2008 financial crisis. We entered into a huge denial in 2010-2011 when we tried to pretend that uh, you can deal with these insolvencies, both of the banking sectors of Europe as well as the states, the public debt sectors, uh, as if they were problems of liquidity, by extending loans, which were extended on condition of uh, the greatest austerity for the economies in the greatest crisis. Now, in 2012, the monetary union really collapsed. It was saved at the last moment by very skillful intervention by the President of the European Central Bank, who made a, an important speech uh, in London in which he said that he would do all it takes, whatever it takes, to save the monetary union. And a few months later, a few weeks later, he followed this up with a promise to burn any bond dealer who bets against Italian and Spanish debt in particular. That Quam, uh, quelled the, uh, the, the forces of destruction in the bond markets, but of course the problem didn't go away, it simply metastasized like a cancer, it moved from the bond markets onto the real economy, and this is why we have a situation where the, the whole of Europe now is in the clasps of deflation, and why Mr. Draghi again has to indulge in what is called, known as quantitative easing, but the, the crisis hasn't gone away. Now, what can I say about Greece? Greece was the flimsiest part of this edifice that was not well designed. And when you have an edifice that's not well designed and it's hit by an earthquake like the 2008 Great Financial Crisis, 
uh, that edifice begins to unravel, to fragment, uh, at the flimsiest apartment unit uh, part of it. Greece was the country with the highest uh, debt to GDP ratio during the good times. It had a very um, inefficient economy, uncompetitive economy, highly unequal society with a great deal of corruption. Uh, the, the vast ma the majority of people worked long hours, but not very productively because of lack of capital goods, uh, machinery, uh, technology. And uh, the result was that when the great crisis hit, Greece was hit the worst. Had Greece not been in the Eurozone, uh, the Greek drachma would have um, taken a hit, it would have been devalued, competitiveness would have been restored. Greece would not never have had the debts that it did, because the reason why we had all those debts in 2010 was because for 10 years the, the, the money markets lived under the illusion that whether you lent to a Greek or to a German or to Italian it was the same thing, so a lot of more debt flowed into Greece as a result of this illusion that of riskless risk throughout the Eurozone. Um, so Greece would have been recovering uh, since at least 2011, had we not been in the Eurozone. But the tragedy, of course, is that it's one thing to say that we shouldn't have been in the Eurozone. It's quite another to say that we should get out of it. Um, uh, I always use the metaphor of uh, Hotel California, the famous Eagle song, which finishes off with the lines you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. So we're in the Eurozone, we are going to stay in the Eurozone, we are all going to stay in the Eurozone. The Eurozone was badly designed, and we need to redesign it, we need to fix it. And we need to fix it because at the moment, throughout Europe, not just in Greece, uh, even in countries that have been hailed as grand uh, success stories uh, regarding the bailouts and the way that uh, the crisis was handled, like Ireland, uh, talk to the Irish, they will give you a very different story. The scars of the crisis are there, the wounds have not healed, uh, and unfortunately you have an export of uh, these um, uh, detrimental forces to hitherto quite powerful and strong parts of the Union. Even in Germany, we are witnessing an increase in the proportion of working poor in society. Um, you'll find that um, quite naturally and with good reason, a very significant uh, proportion of German working people are feeling the pinch. They're not feeling that they're doing well, even though the macroeconomic statistics for Germany are um, very healthy. So in order to turn Europe again into the realm of shared prosperity, we need to redesign it. And um, unfortunately, we need to do this in a climate when one proud nation is pointing fingers at another proud nation, and instead of having the unity which is necessary, in order to consolidate and move ahead, we're having this unity. The only beneficiaries, however, of this unity are the anti-Europeans, the nationalists, the bigots, the racists, and the neo-fascists. So it is imperative for all of us that we stop thinking in terms of us against them, in terms of north against south, in terms of creditors versus debtors, but we should start thinking in terms of uh, members of a union that need do what the United States did after the various crises in the 19th century. Every time the United States had a major crisis in the 19th century, then again 1907, 1911, 1929, even in the 1960s with the Great Society, uh, they pulled together and the Union became stronger. In Europe, we claim that this is what's happening, but it isn't what is really happening. We have a banking union in Europe, which is not really a banking union. We have new institutions like the European Stability Mechanism that are not really promoting stability or consolidation. And this is what our government, uh, the new government of Syriza in Greece, what we're trying to argue. We're trying to argue for a comprehensive rethink of uh, the architecture of the union in, a, in the context of uh, a narrative 
that is unifying and that is uh, refusing to succumb to the uh, obscene tendency, the sinister tendency, to think in terms of confrontation and of one nation versus another. Uh, yes. I would like to go with questions now from the panel. Mm -hmm. And the first question is from uh, Pablo Pinto, who has been very, uh, very much involved into studying the Argentinian crisis, which, to our opinion, bears big similarities with Greece, tying the currency within with the framework of a very strong and hard currency. So Pablo says, I'm interested in the main political economy considerations that affect this choice. Which Greek and Eurozone actors would prefer to see Greece leave the Monetary Union? Is a deeper fiscal integration feasible? Mm -hmm. Well, let me address the point about Argentina versus Greece. Uh, there are similarities, it's true. So Argentina had a one-to-one -one, um, exchange rate with the US dollar, which created, just like in the Eurozone, a massive inflight of capital, that caused bubbles to be created. Then when the bubbles burst, uh, there was a big loan uh, extended by primarily the International Monetary Fund that allowed for uh, rich people in particular to get their money out in good time and for some of them to liquidate various assets and bring them out before, of course, the whole thing collapsed. And the bill uh, was sent to the weakest people who had never benefited either from the boom era or from the IMF loan. But there is a profound difference. And the profound difference is that Argentina had its own currency. It was pegged to the US dollar, but it had its own currency. So when you have your own currency um, and you have this kind of derailment, it's quite straightforward. Overnight, the government or the central bank makes a decision, not an easy one, but nevertheless one that can be made easily, to sever the peg and for allow uh, market forces to take control, to devalue the Argentinian currency, the pesos, and therefore to increase competitiveness, reduce the size of the debts in dollar terms domestically. Um, these adjustments are always painful, but nevertheless, they work. A few years later, the Argentinian economy was growing very, very, very robustly. Um, regardless of what happened 10 years later, uh, you know, the, the, the eventual uh, macroeconomic difficulties uh, have to do with a degree of mismanagement, but that, as, that was a de decade later. It didn't have to happen that way. In the case of Greece, of Ireland, of uh, Latvia, of member states of the Eurozone, we don't have our, our, our own currency to uh, devalue. It is not as if we have the drachma. Uh, which is um, pegged to the euro. If we did, of course we should have divided it. The moment the Greek uh, public debt blew up and Greece became unviable within uh, essentially uh, a hard currency monetary union, in, in order to exit the euro, you have to create a currency to value it. Given the, the creation of a currency it takes minutes, this would be the equivalent in Argentina of announcing eight, ten months before it happened a devaluation. <laughs> that would have been catastrophic. So anybody who understands Argentina uh, will understand that the Greek situation is very different. So that, that is why I'm saying that uh, we, are, we live under the Eagles doctrine. We cannot, we can check out but we can't leave. Very, very clear. And one of the questions actually uh, Pinto asked is whether doesn't Greece leave the Eurozone? But I think you covered that very well. So I'm going to now to Ben Sorensen, who has studied Europe and European debt a bit. And he says economists have several conditions under which a country would benefit from being a part of a currency union. The issue is what countries do when there are bad times for the economy. And there is a list of 
There, there is a list of toolkits. Uh, there is a list of tools, actually, probably not toolkits. Flexibility in prices and wages. The critical issue is downward flexibility in order to restore competitiveness in bad times. Mobility of labor. Saving of bad times. Federalism, which I think you articulated when you spoke at the very beginning, in the first 15 minutes. Uh, so you don't need to repeat yourself. And he has a very interesting fourth idea, very interesting to my opinion, diversification of ownership. Companies operating in Greece would be owned by foreigners, while Greek savings would be invested in other countries. What would be your response, especially to the last one? Allow me to be um, diplomatic. It was like <laughs> it sounds like um, a very decent account of um, the, the so-called theory of optimal currency areas, which, however, is based on certain assumptions that we economists like to make to make our lives easier and make our teachings in the lecture theater more palatable to students. But unfortunately, these assumptions, even though they succeed quite well at making our mathematical models more manageable, nevertheless they have one major disconnect with reality. They don't include the notion of debt. These are models in which no one owes anything to anyone, but all uh, transactions clear and all markets are more or less perfect in the sense that there is no difference between price and opportunity cost. Um, I, will, I allowed myself just for a moment to go back to my you know, economic uh, um, professorial uh, tendencies. But it's short. When I, <laughs> uh, in, in short, uh, what I'm saying is that all, the, all that you said is perfectly spot on. But in an economy where you, you have no debt and you have no oligopoly. Let's take a couple of examples from what you mentioned. The question of uh, downward price flexibility and wage flexibility, because wage is also a price, price of labor. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the basic proposition here is that if you don't have your own currency, okay, and there is a shock to the system, there is a loss of competitiveness in country A relative to country B. And in the country A, if you had your currency, the currency would divide. And then suddenly the, the economy in country A becomes more competitive. It restores its competitiveness to a certain extent. So the argument is, if you don't have your own currency, well, why can't you have the same effect of devaluation? Uh, when prices come down in euros or dollars, um, and if prices and wages come down by 10%, then you have a 10% devaluation for country A. Isn't, the same, isn't this the same thing? Well, the answer is yes, as long as you don't have debt. Because if country A has a debt to country B, or to private investors in Japan or China or wherever, um, the, the drop 10%, 20%, 30% drop in prices and wages uh, does restore Competitiveness to some extent, to a large extent, but it minimizes the capacity of that country to repay its debts because its debts will not devalue. Its debts will be in nominal terms, in euro terms. So if you had, you know, this is what happened in Greece. We had a 30, 45% reduction in wages, a much smaller reduction in prices. So yes, Greek labor became cheaper, so in that sense, competitiveness was restored. But our mountains of debt, both private and public, were in euros. So if the whole population is earning less, and the reason why this debacle has begun was because the original debts were unsustainable and could not be paid back, uh, how much? much more difficult is it now to pay them back when all the incomes have shrunk? So this model of optimal currency areas uh, breaks down if you, if you, if you uh, add debt to the equation. Also, if you add oligopoly and asymmetrical development in the mix, then it gets even worse. Because let me put it this way. However low Greek wages will fall, 
Greek car production is, going, is not going to increase. Why? Because we don't make cars. So <laughs> there will not be Greek cars are not going to become more competitive vis-à-vis -vis German cars if uh, wages even go to zero. Uh, so the, 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 the theoretical model that you were uh, referring to, or the questioner was uh, uh, referring to implicitly, is really not the economic model in which we live. Um, one more example. You mentioned labor mobility. In the United States, Detroit goes under, people leave. Uh, people, lots of people left Nevada. Uh, America is a country on the move. It's, the people leave state A to go state B when uh, state B produces more jobs, like Texas, for instance, attracting lots of people from throughout the United States. But the United States is functioning like a proper monetary union. Uh, so uh, the de the, the, there is no uh, state of Nevada debt as such, and if there is, if there is a, a city of Detroit that it gets it gets haircut, Americans are very quick to to to, to haircut debt. So, for instance, General Motors went under in 2009. There was a 90 percent haircut. Uh, Americans are very practical, very pragmatic about that. They don't think that debt is a sin, and they don't believe that if you cut debt, then you are um, sort of crossing moral Rubicon. If you, if you know what I mean. Uh, um, so imagine, imagine that there are many, many jobs now in Germany, assuming, right? And all Greeks migrate and move to, you know, all working age Greeks go to Germany and find good jobs. What happens with Greek public debt? Who pays that off? No one. <laughs> there will be no people earning money here to pay off that debt, so you'd have to haircut. But and again, a hidden world in Europe. So the optimal currency area theory can't possibly apply in the case of the Eurozone. Let me interject a bit because uh, I think I need to shut down my camera. I hope you don't mind because at least I will uh, make better use of the bandwidth. Please. So we see only you, now you see only my picture. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a nice picture. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Actually, uh, I, since you became the Minister of Finance, I'm having quite a bit of... Uh, I'm actually being your impersonator. Very good. Many people call me, and we have also both Akis as a suffix, so many That's people right. now stopped calling me Papa Dakis and they call me Varoufakis, <laughs> especially with this haircut, which I prepared especially for this interview. So how about the diversification of ownership? Mm -hmm. Well, look, this again, it, it reveals um, uh, an economic model uh, background which is um, precisely the opposite of, of reality. Greece is a deficit state within the Eurozone. Like, you know, Missouri is a deficit state in the United States. Always was, always will be, right? Uh, so, think about England, Northern England. Northern England is always going to be in deficit in relation to London. Uh, these are the facts of life. There are certain areas within a union that will be in deficit to other areas that will always be in surplus, or at least for centuries. Now, when you are a deficit state within a monetary union, what does this mean? It means that there must be, in equilibrium as we say, a net capital flow into your state. If you're a deficit nation, it means you buy BMWs and Mercedes-Benzes from Germany and you export, let's say, oranges and olive oil. Clearly, there's going to be a current account trade deficit for Greece. Okay? Uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, foreigners get more money from trade with Greece than Greeks get from trade with foreigners, with non-Greeks within that monetary union. Now, for this, for the books to balance, given that the Greeks pay more to the non-Greeks in the Eurozone than they receive from them, there must be um, a, a, a stream of capital coming into Greece in the form of loans, in the form of um, investment into real estate, and so on. And so forth. Huh? That means that savings of the Greeks and Greek companies are not going to be invested outside of Greece. It's the opposite that will happen. Everybody else's savings will be invested in Greece. Of course, some Greeks will, will be investing abroad. And of course, many rich Greeks have invested greatly 
in the great cities uh, of uh, Northern Europe. Um, in London, even in Frankfurt, you'll find Greeks owning mansions and real estate. Uh, but aggregate, in aggregate, it will always be the case that the deficit state imports other people's savings uh, as well as their goods. Uh, his uh, last question would be with regards to austerity. Mm -hmm. Austerity can be achieved by raising taxes or cutting government spending. Anecdotal and other evidence points to Greece having a very inefficient taxation and personal uh, taxation income, or maybe even culture of tax avoidance. Of course, I don't think to have to ask you whether this is true. We both know that this is true. Is it fixable if uh, not Greek voters, that's what he says, willing to accept spending cuts? Are they going to accept Greek defaults? Well, we had the most uh, spectacular uh, spending cuts in the history of capitalism. The fiscal consolidation that was achieved by the Greek state in the last five years has, is unprecedented during peacetime anywhere in the world. So the Greek state has shrunk. Greek public spending has nosedived. Dove. It's just spectacular. Uh, unfortunately, along with it, you had a massive reduction in national income and therefore an incapacity of uh, the Greeks to do both, pay their taxes and survive. Uh, tragically, of course, the rich Greeks, and the ones who were responsible for, the, for, for bringing Greece to the state in which it found itself in 2010, well, they and their money have fled. At least their money has fled to London, to, Los to Zurich, to Geneva, to Wall Street, to Frankfurt. And they're not paying for it. It's the poorer Greeks, the ones who were mostly uh, innocent of the causes of the crisis, of the Greek debacle, uh, that uh, are being forced to pay through the nose. And once you do that, you have a breakdown of uh, social consensus, and the country becomes very, very hard to reform. The reason why we were elected in, on January the 25th was because the Greeks had enough of that. And we were elected on a mandate to reform Greece to make sure that uh, the culture of uh, tax immunity for those who have to pay tax and can afford to do it uh, will have to end. Uh, we will do our damnest to ensure that they do. But we will only succeed when the rest of our Eurozone partners uh, accept the proposition that there is a new government in place which is not interested in perpetuating the crisis. It is not interested in getting more loans from the rest of Europe and from the IMF on condition of further austerity, which shrinks incomes further, making the whole thing less sustainable, not more sustainable, and turning Greece into a failed state. That is our mandate, to put an end to this and to make those who can pay, pay, while stabilizing the Greek economy, helping it grow so that we can repay our debts to our partners. Thank you. Moving now to the questions of uh, Mark Winnie, who is actually has worked quite a bit in the... Uh, he's the vice president of the Federal uh, Bank in Dallas. And he spent also some time working in Frankfurt for the European Monetary Institute. So he is asking a few questions. In retrospect, what do you think was a good? Uh, was, do you think that it was a good idea to join the euro, or would have been better sticking with the drachma? I shall answer this uh, frankly and truthfully. But before I say this, before I give you my answer, let me be very clear that it has been my considered opinion right from the outset, from the beginning of this crisis, that Greece has no alternative but to stay in the Eurozone. And we should do, and we are doing, our damnness to make sure that we stay in the Eurozone. Having said that, we shouldn't have gotten in. It's quite clear. It's actually quite clear that the Eurozone was very badly designed. I don't think that 
if Germany knew in 2000, the majority of Germans knew in 2000 what they know now, that they would have abandoned the Deutschmark for the year. It was an architecture. I have nothing against the common currency. That particular design, the past 60s design, as we say, uh, was a terrible one. The idea of uh, maintaining each nation's public debt separate from everybody else's uh, and simply unifying uh, and keeping our banking sector separate and having the states respond, be responsible for their public debt as well as the banking sectors when they lack a central bank with the capacity to help them during bad times. And when you have a central bank that is lacking a state, a federal state, to have its back, that is a design that, that, that couldn't possibly avoid a major crisis. So we shouldn't have been part of it. But once you're in, you're locked in it. And getting out, let me use a spatial metaphor. Uh, the path that we followed to enter the Eurozone doesn't exist anymore. If we try to retrace our steps backwards, uh, we'll fall off a major cliff. This is why it is so imperative that we Europeans find a way of fixing and redesigning the architecture of the Eurozone. There is no turning back now. Uh, his next question is, what are you going to do to, supply, to free up the supply side in the economy? Well, this is a crucial question because uh, Greece is a, a very curious case study. It's a unique, a unique example of uh, what happens during a period of massive fiscal consolidation and of a, a, a huge drop in living standards, in wages, as well as in prices. So, as I said before, wages fell by 45%, right? And yet, <laughs> It's flat. That, there's, no, there's no explanation for that. People say to me, oh, it's because you, you, you didn't, you know, Greece failed to carry out reforms. That's nonsense. Even, firstly, Greece did carry out reforms. But even if we had carried out no reform at all, a 45% reduction in wages, Keteris Paribus, should have produced a very significant export growth. Hmm? It didn't. The reason why it didn't was twofold is twofold, or if you want, threefold. The first reason is we have no really serious credit provision. Our banking sector, uh, very quickly after the Greek state went under, uh, also became initially insolvent, and then even though it was recapitalized by the Greek taxpayers, uh, it failed to operate properly the banking sector that borrows and lends. And the reason, of course, is we have um, a very large pr proportion of non-performing loans weighing down the asset books of the banks. So this is, this is a major problem. Let me give you an example. There are profitable export-oriented companies in Greece, manufacturers. They have a full order book from overseas. They have um, a sterling record of being profitable for 10 years now in a row, and yet they can't get credit. They have no capacity to purchase inputs raw materials because banks do not lend to them and the reason is that banks can't lend to anyone, they are zombie banks really. Um, and at the same time, um, customers, overseas customers, are asking for some kind of uh, credit letter, some kind of uh, guarantee that the export is going to reach them. The banks won't provide that either. So you have these companies that are ready to be profitable and to increase exports, and, and there is a backlog, and there is a sorry backlog, a bottleneck, I should say. So the, the pertinent question was: How can you increase supply? How can you deal with the problem of bottled up supply? The, the first answer has to do with the credit system. We need a bad bank that will absorb the non-performing loans of the banking system. This is something we can only do after negotiating with our partners and institutions. The second reason, of course, has to do with the fact that the state, because it suffers from illiquidity itself, is notorious for returning VAT, value-added taxes, to exporters, as it should, because exports are not taxed in 
terms of value added, as you know. And yet exporters they may take 18 months to get their money back from the state. So, so, that's, so that's another reason. And thirdly, and very importantly, you have to realize that a terrible recession like the one that Greece has undergone is bad for competition. Because what is a recession? A, a depression. Is, it, is, it is nothing else than a cascade of bankruptcies. So when lots and lots of companies go bust and disappear, they're not replaced by new ones. Uh, what you have is a reduction in the number of competi competitors. The concentration ratio, as industrial economists call it, goes up. So you have less competition, more oligopoly power. That increases the price-cost margin. As that happens, the efficiency of the existing companies, of the surviving companies, um, doesn't receive a boost because they can have higher profit margins without actually increasing their efficiency, and that impedes export performance. So what we need to do is we need to fix the credit system, we need to fix the banking system through negotiation with our creditors. Uh, we have an idea that the FSF buffer of 11 billion should be used to create a bad bank to absorb the NPLs. <laughs> Uh, second thing we need to do is we need to um, have an, also through negotiation a revamp of the fiscal policy of the Greek state so that the Greek state has more liquidity in order to return VAT, um, VAT taxes to business. And thirdly, we need to open up product markets and be a lot more vigilant than we have been to safeguard competition. This is not easy. So, now there are three more questions which I can group into one question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is basically, you see as a whole package, the restructuring, well, l let me use, not use that verb because it has been very, uh, very targeted uh, in the last few months for Greece. What would be a way to readjust the Greek debt as a whole uh, relative to the GDP in order to be able to start seeing a relief in the economy? Well, I would use the word structure. Let's not beat up out the bush. Um, we don't need to use the word haircut. We don't need a haircut. But we need a restructure. We need a more sensible structure of the Greek debt. The Greek debt now comprises a number of slices. I'm not going to go into the technicalities of it. Not all of, it's not homogeneous. There are different parts, different slices of debt. But the, and, and, and our proposals um, uh, take the form of a menu of different swaps, debt swaps, not swaps, for each one of these slices. Uh, but this is a technical issue. I'm not going to uh, bother you with it. But the basic idea is very simple. Why can't we link the rate of repayment, or repayments, if you want, of our debt to our partners to nominal GDP growth? In other words, to have a situation where the more we grow per quarter, per year, the more we pay back during that year. Because if we agree on that, then what we have is, it's, 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 in a sense, it's a statement to the rest of the world that our partners and our creditors have become partners in our growth, that they have a vested interest in seeing us grow as much as possible, because the more we grow, the more money they get. We always have a vested interest in growing, because it's the only way of growing out of the misery of the present uh, situation, right? So suddenly you would have incentive compatibility. This is a term that game theorists use. My com incentives are compatible with yours. The very announcement of such incentive compatibility would create a lot more trust around the world, and especially in the mind of investors, regarding the Greek economy. So not only would you have a more rational structure for the Greek debt, but you would have a great capital inflow into Greece as the investor community around the world gains uh, confidence in Europe's and Greece's joint interest in growing Greece. So this is the main idea that I'm putting, putting, pushing forward. Uh, in the last, uh, actually, what do you think can be the major engines of growth for the Greek economy right now, as is, as it stands? Where would you start? 
Well, you always need to differentiate, to discriminate between short term, medium term and long term as in any economy. In the short term, the very announcement of an agreement with our partners and institutions would on its own bring about a boost. Why? Because at the moment, uh, fear of impasse has uh, pushed asset prices uh, through the floor. The very announcement that we have an agreement is going to give rise to an influx of capital as uh, Greek assets immediately will be recognized to be bargains. That influx of capital is going to create an impetus of growth anyway. So that's in the very short term. In the medium and long term, Greece has a number of potential growth industries. Uh, besides tourism, tourism of course is a very important industry in Greece and it's actually been doing quite well of recent and we hope to have a very good tourist season beginning very soon. But besides tourism, we have uh, a number of advantages. Um, Greece is the obvious place to have uh, solar energy and wind energy and we, we already have uh, a degree of success in that realm but we need a lot more of it. Greece is a major hub for uh, shipping goods in from Asia and elsewhere into Central Europe. So our ports and our railways have a great capacity to develop and we are moving in this direction with uh, various schemes for uh, um, exploiting public assets, railways and ports and roads. Then we have, you may be surprised to hear that, uh, a, a nascent but very successful pharmaceutical industry. We have uh, a significant comparative advantage in terms of a very well educated uh, labor force. Unfortunately, over the last few years, we've been losing a lot of them. The brain drain during the crisis is uh, uh, unbearable. But nevertheless, there is room for uh, high tech industries, software companies, startups. Uh, think of Israel, for instance, as an example of what could be the medium to, to long term future for Greece. Okay. Now we'll go to the last part. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions that came up from the audience is if Greece has to default its loans. Let's say that you, 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 you basically said before that this is a very hypothetical situation. Wouldn't that make everyone in the markets reconsider sovereign debt as a very good form of investment, as the safest form of investment? Look, you're asking now, not just the person that, 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 you, that you met a few couple of years ago at the University of Texas, you're asking a finance minister. So as a finance minister, I'm going to have to, to refuse any discussion of default. But having said that, of course, because <laughs> I'm always going to be an academic at heart, uh, of course it's not a good thing to have any default. The, 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 the particular character of the Greek debt, however, is such that most of the debt the public debt is not in private hands. So when you hear me speak of a debt restructure, uh, I'm not talking about the private debt. No. Only what 15% of Greece's debt is in private hands. The rest is has already been transferred through the previous bailout schemes of 2010 and 2012. It has been moved on or pushed on, unfortunately, but nevertheless it has been done, onto the shoulders of taxpayers, Greek taxpayers and European taxpayers. So any destruction would affect, uh, would, would essentially be a family affair between the Greek state and other states. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a few more questions. Uh, this this one is uh, quite technical. Mm -hmm. How much of the Greek debt is now part of the bailout of the Greek banks? And shouldn't that part be repaid by the banks themselves? 90 percent. 
of the 90% of the loans that the Greek state received from the institutions and its partners has gone into repaying uh, bank debts or into the fo- in the form of bank recapitalizations. So the recapitalization of the Greek banks came to something like um, uh, 41 billion. Uh, that was money that the Greek taxpayer borrowed from the European taxpayer and the international taxpayer through the IMF in order to give to the Greek banks. Um, the vast majority of the remaining money went into redeeming um, bonds, Greek government bonds, that were uh, owned by financial institutions. So let me give you an example. In 2010, when the Greek state was teetering, on the, it was on the brink, the Greek government bonds were trading in the market at an 80% discount. And these bonds were made whole by means of bailout loans that uh, the Greek taxpayers took onto their shoulders so as to make sure that the banks, mainly French and German banks, would be repaid. So, Greece has a very important position in that part of the world right now, and which is becoming increasingly more unstable. Mm-hmm. So, wouldn't basically a redemption of part of the debt be seen like a a lease for Greece's stability in this critical geopolitical position which in which it resides? You are quite right that geopolit- the geopolitics uh, of the situation are significant, or they ought to be significant. Don't forget that as we speak, and this is something that the United States audience uh, will clearly understand as uh, substantial and significant. Uh, as we speak, we have a uh, serious problem with uh, fundamentalism just, just south of Crete, on the shores of Libya. We have, um, as you know, the human catastrophe in Syria and surrounding areas with ISIS, uh, and that is pushing into the underbelly of our neighbor, of our great neighbor, Turkey. We have uh, uh, the Ukraine, and the Ukraine-Russia uh, contest on the just just north of the Black Sea, uh, and Greece has always been not just now uh, at the crossroads between Asia and Europe. It is an an island of stability in the area, and um, any anyone who visits during the summer from the United States or from elsewhere will know and will witness how important that island of stability is. It's a very peaceful country, a country where um, you simply, despite the economic crisis, uh, you can feel absolutely and utterly safe. And that should be preserved. The the Great Depression, the winter of discontent that we Greeks are experiencing at the moment should be dealt with, forthwith, to uh, prevent any kind of destabilization from a ge- geopolitical sense. But by the way, Manu, let me just say this, that we don't need a major uh, uh, sort of write-off of Greek debt. It would be good to have it. All debtors would like to have that. But this is not what we are really proposing. What we are proposing is a sensible mix of policies that will allow us to grow out of uh, the crisis so as to make sure that in net present value terms, as we economists say, we can repay most of our debt back, if not all of it. But for this, we need a sensible reappraisal of the so-called program of fiscal consolidation, what is more broadly known as austerity, or what I call Ponzi austerity, because it's austerity based on a lot of loans, and new loans too, Um, so as to affect this combination of uh, economic recovery and geopolitical stabilization. Final uh, question is about Greece's competitiveness within the Eurozone. In particular, Greece has a a very big comparative advantage relative to other uh, countries of the Eurozone in terms of the shipping business and the shipping industry. Would you like to comment about that? Historically speaking, uh, Greeks have been sailors since time immemorial. 
And the shipping industry is an astonishingly successful industry. But again, historically speaking, if you look at the 19th century, for instance, Greek ship owners uh, didn't live in Greece and didn't have much to do with Greece because in the early part of the 19th century, Greece didn't exist. We were part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and beyond that, because they, by definition, ship owners and captains of ships were highly mobile people, they always had, you know, they were always part of globalized capitalism. So they had uh, headquarters in Odessa, in London, in Malta, in Cyprus, in Alexandria, in London, did I mention one? Well, London, uh, all over the world, some of them even in as far as Australia. The problem that we still have, um, speaking now again as a finance minister of the Hellenic state, the Hellenic Republic, is that most of the ship owners are um, uh, domiciled uh, in Britain, in London. So even though culturally, spiritually, the shipping, the Greek shipping industry is a Greek shipping industry, in terms of uh, financial and uh, uh, fiscal jurisdiction, that is not the case, if you know what I mean. But probably I didn't make my question very clear. You could encourage uh, with basically giving them full uh, or almost practically full tax forgiveness, you could encourage them to have much higher number of Greeks in, among the crew composition. Wouldn't that help? Because those Greek salaries, those salaries would now come in Greece. Well, no, and it's spending. that's not so because already they have as much tax immunity as they need. They pay very, very little tax. Uh, and when you have, I mean, a lot, a lot of these uh, ship owners do employ Greeks. But the numbers involved, especially now with super efficient tankers and container ships that, that, that use very small crews, right? That is not a solution to our employment problem. And in any case, let's face it, Greek wages will never be able to compete, never, with Liberian wages, with Nigerian wages, with Pakistani wages. Um, and of course the reason for that is because Greek prices cannot never compete with prices from those parts of the world. So that is not the solution, I'm afraid. So, last question and we close. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do what, how do you envision to improve the overall competitiveness of Greece? Well, as I said before, what we need is, firstly, we need to achieve uh, a sensible, mutually beneficial, uh, honorable agreement with our partners in the negotiation that we are conducting presently. That on its own is going to be very significant because, as I said, wages are already very low in Greece and prices are much lower than they used to be, so Greece is competitive as we speak. All we need is a sustainable macroeconomic uh, framework that can only be agreed with institutions as a result of the negotiation, the present negotiation. Beyond that, of course, there are things we need to do. We need to, to, to attack bureaucracy. Um, bureaucracy is a, is a significant impediment to growth in this country. Uh, tax evasion and corruption, and of course, what we the, 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 we need to liberalise product markets in a way that uh, oligopolistic, rent-seeking behaviour is, uh, if not eliminated, can't be eliminated. It's all over the world, but it can be diminished substantially. Mr. Minister. Thank you very much for this interview. I will let you be with your family now. The kids can play with no interrupts. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interview, and I hope I will see you in Greece when I'll visit in June. My greetings to Texas. Thank you very much. Greetings from Texas. Thank you very much. Bye, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. Reflecting the flight to quality within the Eurozone. Um, this has also created huge problems for the Swiss as well, which we don't need to worry about here in this forum. Now, just to show you some pictures, these are government deficits relative to GDP for the four countries that were bailed out. Actually, I'm leaving out Cyprus here. So these are the four big ones, or relatively big ones, Spain, uh, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. Um, so zero is no government deficit. Above the line means you're running a surplus. Below the line means you're running a deficit. 
Now the rule book said, if you were in the Eurozone, you were not allowed to have a deficit of more than 3% of GDP. Okay, and that's the hatched red line that I've shown there, the reference line. You can see that prior to the crisis, neither Spain nor Ireland were running deficits. Spain and Ireland got into problems for uh, very different reasons than Greece or Portugal. Both adhered to fiscal discipline in the run-up to the crisis. They got into problems because of the massive housing booms and busts that took place in those countries. And the minister alluded to this in his remarks, drawing an analogy between Nevada and Ireland. And in fact, what happened in Ireland dwarfs anything that happened in Nevada. Uh, in Ireland, at the height of the boom, real estate construction accounted for 14% of GDP. They were building houses in Ireland for the people who were moving to Ireland to build houses in Ireland. It was an absolutely astonishing, you know, unsustainable situation. Far in excess. So in the United States as a whole, real estate construction went from 4 to 6%, and that created a problem for us. In Ireland, it went from 4 to 14%. It came crashing down. And then you had this massive collapse of the banking sector. You see that suddenly Ireland goes from running surpluses to the biggest deficit in recorded history as a result of the need to bail out their banks. 32% of GDP in 2010, but then back to surplus quickly. Um, Greece here, you only see numbers from 2006. That's not because Greece wasn't running deficits prior to 2006. It's because the numbers prior to 2006 are so unreliable that they are no longer reported. And this, therein lies also part of the problem that Greece has had to deal with since this crisis erupted. Here's a second metric. So the first picture was showing you de deficits to GDP. This is the, the cumulative result of these deficits. It's debt to GDP. Again, the Maastricht rule said that you had to have a debt to GDP ratio of 60% or lower to join the monetary union. And again, you see that prior to the crisis, both Ireland and Spain, no problem meeting that 60% criterion. Portugal, a very, very different story. And Greece was already well above the 60% limit when the crisis erupted in 2010. And it's just gotten even worse, gone from 100% to now close to 200% of GDP. Again, that is a very, very difficult number to deal with and manage. Now, this is about the best picture you can get to summarize how things have changed over the course of the monetary union. This is just a picture of 10 year sovereign bond rates, the interest rates paid by governments in the euro area that, for long term debt, 10 year debt, okay? You see that prior to the launch of the euro, okay, to the left, from 1990 up to 1999, markets charged very different interest rates to different sovereigns in the euro area. Specifically, Greece was paying interest rates close to 20-25% to borrow prior to its joining the euro area. Now, in the run-up to the launch of the monetary union, these interest rates converged. And essentially, once everybody joined the monetary union, you see there from 1999 forward, or in the case of Greece from 2001 forward, financial markets did not distinguish between debt issued by the Germans and debt issued by the Greeks. And again, the minister alluded to this in his remarks. And this, in some sense, facilitated the ability of high-risk countries on the periphery to borrow large amounts of money that then proved difficult to service. Once the crisis erupted, it's as if monetary union never took place. You go back in history, suddenly now markets are distinguishing between debt issued by Greece, Ireland, Spain, Germany, and so on. And in fact, German debt, interest rates on German debt are at historic, never in the history of Germany, which is only back to 1870. You can go back and pick any German state prior to 1870, Prussia or whatever. Never has it been cheaper for German governments to borrow because it is the ultimate uh, safe haven within the euro area. This is, no, sorry. this is just giving you, uh, for comparison, what happens within the United States. Again, the minister talked about the differences between the states within the U.S. and how the U.S. functions as a monetary union, and we can talk about this in a panel discussion. Most of the time, financial markets don't distinguish between debt issued by individual states within the United States. You can see here the 10-year municipal bond rates are pretty similar until the financial crisis hit. And then the, the problems with a lot of states became apparent, and then suddenly markets began to distinguish between debt issued by Illinois versus debt issued by California, New York, or Texas. Texas is one of the better credit risks, obviously, within the 
the United States. Again, financial markets are now more discerning. We've actually had municipalities default, okay? Detroit being the highest profile example. And it is possible for states within the United States to default on their debt. It has actually happened in US history. Now, to give you a sense of just how bad, how tragic the current situation is in Greece, I think it's useful to just draw a comparison with the United States history. The most traumatic event in US economic history ever until the recent Great Recession was, of course, the Great Depression of the 1930s. And here's what happened to the unemployment in the United States during the Great Depression from 1929 up to 1940. It went from less than 5% to close to one quarter of the US labor force at the height or depth of the Great Depression. Here's what's happened in Ireland over the course of the recent episode, starting in 2007 and using projected unemployment rates out to 2018 from the OECD. And Irish unemployment peaked at about 15% of the labor force uh, in 2012, okay? Pretty bad, not quite as bad as the Great Depression in the United States. Here's what happened in Portugal, somewhat worse than Ireland. Unemployment close to 20% of the labor force. But I mean, you're talking about a, almost a Great Depression-like event. Here's what's happened in Greece. It's worse than a Great Depression event. I mean, we can look at other metrics of economic performance. You're going to see the same thing. What Greece is dealing with now is a Great Depression-like event, comparable in scale or uh, magnitude to what the United States had to deal with in the 1930s. And then. Um, Here's what's gone on in Spain. Again, Spain is also dealing with a Great Depression-like event. Again, key difference between Greece and Spain. Spain has actually successfully exited its adjustment program. Greece is still uh, in its program. So what are the fixes? Well, the minister talked in his remarks about the need for a fiscal and a banking union and the flaws in the design of monetary union. The, the, the original design of monetary union as laid out in the Maastricht Treaty, this, this book was here, did not uh, provide for a fiscal union or a banking union. Um, I'm of the opinion, and this is a minority opinion, that a monetary union can work without a, a, a fiscal or a banking union. However, you have to have rules to make it work. And the, the, the authors of the Maastricht Treaty actually laid out, laid out a series of rules. Unfortunately, the rules were not adhered to. And it's not just Greece that was a violator, although it was probably the most egregious violator of the rules in terms of the public finances. Importantly, France and Germany were big violators of the fiscal rules in 2003. They essentially tore up the rule book when they were going to be subject to the sanctions provided for in the rules. And that set a very, very bad precedent for how the politics would play out within the monetary union. The other option is to try to create a fiscal and political union along US lines. Um, and this could work. The problem is, is there a political will to do this? And I think it's pretty obvious to most observers that Europeans still, you know, while there is the sentiment that you know, Europe is important as an abstract concept, Europe is the, the, the home of the concept of nationalism, and national identity is still terribly important among the sovereign states of Europe. And there does not seem to be a huge amount of appetite for the creation of a full-blown fiscal and banking union along the U.S. lines. So that does create problems. Lessons from U.S. history. Um, you know, you can go back in U.S. history and look at the um, situation that we faced in the late 18th, 18th century. Uh, there was a fiscal crisis in the United States associated with the financing of the debt occurred during the Revolutionary War. Basically, the Revolutionary War was financed by debt issued by the individual states. And this ultimately led to a fiscal crisis. So as part of the deal to go from the Articles of Confederation to the US Constitution, um, the, the US federal government took on all of this debt in return for the power to levy certain taxes at the federal level. Uh, and then as part of the deal, you know, there was this one-off bailing out of states, but we said that we'll bail out the states this one time, we're never going to do it again, okay? Thereafter, the U.S., individual U.S. states had to follow very strict fiscal rules. In fact, every U.S. state bar one has to balance its budget every year. There's no 3% deficit, it's like 0% deficit. And that's the rule that individual states in the U.S. have to live by as a quid pro quo for being a monetary fiscal and banking union 
with federal transfers to some of that regional shocks. The alternative for Europe is disunion. What this crisis has wrought is declining trust in the concept of Europe and European institutions. Interestingly, in some of the worst affected countries, including Greece and Italy, there still is enormous support for the concept of the Euro and Europe, some European institutions because they're seen as actually del delivering cleaner governance than the local um, institutions. But generally, people have acquired a less favorable attitude towards the entire European Union. Uh, while most people still support the single currency, it's certainly well down from what it was prior to the crisis. So I'll kind of wrap it up there. But you can see this Euro crisis as a vindication of economic theory. Many years ago, I worked in Frankfurt in the late 1990s uh, for the institution that became the European Central Bank. It was called the European Monetary Institution. But our job was to sort of create the infrastructure for the Euro uh, prior to its launch in 1999. And I remember saying to my, being asked by my then boss was, what was the view in North America about how this project is likely to fare? And I pointed out that at the time, in the 1990s in North America, most economists felt that this was a really bad idea because according to economic theory, Western Europe does not constitute what we refer to as an optimum currency area where it makes, it makes sense to share a single currency. And his response was, well, well, the politicians of Europe have decided that Europe is an optimum currency area. Uh, you can look at this experience as saying, well, you know, so much for the politicians, economic theory actually has been vindicated by what has happened. One possibility, and we've seen that this has already happened, is they have a new set of fiscal rules. And these rules were agreed in 2012. They've now entered into force. The question is whether they're going to prove any more durable than the original Stability and Growth Pact that was effectively torn up in 2003 by the French and the Germans when they were going to be subject to sanctions. The challenges, how are you going to achieve consensus on new rules and the loss of sovereignty that comes with this? You know, are the uh, electorates in the various sovereign states going to be willing to cede more power to Brussels and Frankfurt? Because that's what a banking union and a fiscal union will require. You have market rigidities that create problems in terms of the supply side in the countries that are undergoing adjustment. The austerity programs, which I think are misnamed. And then there's the potential for social unrest, which we've already seen in several countries, which is really um, a serious risk. I threw in this last bullet point a year ago when I gave this talk to another group about Europe 1914 and how on the eve of World War I, it was considered inconceivable that the countries of Europe would ever go to war again because of the close network of trade and financial linkages between them. And that just spat out of control really, really quickly. And I used to think it was unthinkable that this could ever happen again in Europe. Yet, you see the kind of unrest going on in some of these worst affected countries by the crisis, and you have to begin to wonder how this could all end up if it doesn't uh, get managed better. So I will stop with that and hopefully take questions during the panel discussion. Thanks. No, I would have access to this, so I don't have any slides. <coughs> now, um, Mark just happened to mention the concept of optimal currency areas, which I take as my cue, so I'll talk about optimal currency areas, <laughs> which I actually decided in advance. Um, so in my own research, this is what I have been working on. and. In terms of how to get out of the current mess, that's not really something I have much of an opinion about. So I'll tell you about the concept of an optimal currency area. So this is um, the work goes down to uh, Robert Mundell, who was given the Nobel Prize in 1999 for this work. Um, and I just want to mention that <coughs> Mundell is often uh, regarded as a champion of the right. Uh, but what I'm saying, I actually just saw it that is basically the same points I'm making now was made by uh, uh, Krugman in the New York Times and an opinion piece in June 2012. So but this is something, the points I'm making here, uh, <coughs> Krugman is considered to the left, was a point that there's broad agreement on. So, uh, so the question, <coughs> 
is about what are the costs or benefits of a currency union. The, the, the benefits are sort of fairly obvious, although they're often hard to quantify. You don't have to pay fees each time you are selling abroad or importing. And maybe the big advantage is that uh, exporters are not subject to the uncertainty of the exchange rate. Right? So as an example, big exporters to the euro area, they saw in one day, a few months ago, the euro dropped 15%. Right? So if you have sold goods, you're supposed to be paid in euros. You're taking an enormous hit. You can hedge against it, but at that end, you have to pay for one and you can hedge <coughs> for more than a year or two out in the future. So, um, so my own work, I have, I have uh, done empirical work and basically tying into the discussion about Nevada and Ireland, comparing uh, US states with European countries. So you can think what you want about the US economy, this and that, but in terms of being an efficient currency union, you rarely hear anybody wants access to have its own currency, right? So that seems to be functioning very smoothly. So in any event, that if we go back to um, to Blandel, Blandel basically said, <clears throat> well, what do you give up by having a fixed currency, right? Well, the problem is, among the we see now you get hit by a hard shock. You need to restore competitiveness. You probably devalue if you want in a currency, but now you can't, right? So, of course, there's another discussion. How good is it to devalue? We know some countries, Sweden and Iceland, have successfully devalued. Although other countries have devalued, gained competitiveness for a year, and then inflation has spiraled out of control. So that might also be called comfort. But in any event, I mentioned now these the criteria that when they are uh, suggested. So the first thing, <coughs> if you have uh, wages and prices are fully flexible, meaning you get hit by a shock, you're willing to let wages and prices fall. Well, then you de need to devalue the currency, right? A devaluation is really just a way of lowering prices and wages relative to the rest of the world. Now, there's been a little bit of, of research on this issue. Uh, Eric Hurst and some of his courses have looked at the US actually, it's not about Nevada. And you actually do see that prices are not increased very much relative to the rest of the US in the states that were hardest hit. So that partly has been one of the mechanisms helping Nevada. Uh, in a current paper I'm just working on, I've been looking at this issue in Europe. I even have looked at regions within, say, Germany and Spain, and you don't see much of that. So when countries are hit, and you know, by a negative shock, one way to get out, as I said, was to have lower price and wage inflation, but you don't see it. Of course, you would also want the Germans to run up prices, that would help you otherwise. This is a symmetric situation. Uh, only do we see, finally, within the last year or so, that prices in Greece are falling relative to the rest of Europe. So that was one way that you can uh, <clears throat> adjust when you're hit by a shock. The other mechanism that Mandel mentions is, is labor mobility. So that's, we go back to the, like the 1860s when the Erie Canal opened, great crisis crashed in Europe, like a quarter of our streets left from the US. Now that doesn't seem to happen very much anymore. We saw some of it during the boom, actually, when a lot of Polish workers leave the upward pressure on the economy of Ireland and England, the Scandinavian countries. But it's also not something you really want, right? It's, it's, it, it's an adjustment mechanism, but to be forced to leave the country might not be something you want. So the third mechanism you can think of, which is that you save for good times, right? So, <clears throat> if shocks are temporary, well, you can basically borrow, or you can save in advance. Well, we look at the deficit, that didn't happen very much. 
And there's also an issue with this is, if you're hit by a shock that lasts for 10 years, sooner or later, you're going to run out of money via that mechanism. <clears throat> the fourth way of insuring yourself in a way that you can resist or you, can <clears throat> you won't suffer too much in a recession is through diversification of ownership. And that's something that has gotten less attention. Like, but when Nevada was hit by a shock, I don't think that you, your plan, the finance minister was quite correct. What's happening in the US is not that the banks got very loud. What's happening is that you walk down the street a year, you see Bank of America, you see Chase. When Texas get hit by a bad shock, the pain is borne by the stockholders all over the US. Now, just one comment about the adjustment to the crisis. Why, why is Bank of America so big in Texas? In 1985, oil prices fell by like 80%. House prices usually fell by, I think, 60%. Some ridiculous. This is, I think, a crisis that's only too often bad as current crisis. Texas really got hard here. And the US government did not directly pay out the Texas settings and all banks. It helped. Bank of America to take them over, which is something that can be done with less political resistance. It certainly happened, and next time there's a recession, the shock is hit, is carried by all uh, Bank of America stockholders and not owners in Texas. And, but this goes deep, and not to pass the banks, right? Starbucks, Home Depot, you know, ownership of companies in America is highly diversified. Now, one more mechanism that did be mentioned about, that's the one that was talked about, then the federalism. So, um, if you have a federal government <coughs> and you're hit by a shock, maybe they'll bail you out. So in the US, banks are, act, uh, states are actually supposed to be able to go bankrupt. However, they're still a fair amount of insurance coming out of the fiscal union. If Texas takes a hard hit, what's going to happen to your social security? Well, nothing, right? That's been paid by Washington. And your taxes, a biggest fraction of the taxes going to Washington. They're going down. So there's an automatic stabilizing effect via the fiscal union. So, and I'll talk about my own research. My own research has basically focus on trying to quantify these mechanisms within the United States and within Europe. And we didn't set out to find anything in particular. Before we started, they were thought that the main mechanism stabilizing the United States was a fiscal channel. Now, in our data, we found that by far the biggest stabilizing mechanism in the US is cross-ownership of capital and assets that the companies are spread all over the US. When a shock is hit, well, there'll be a shock to workers, but the shock to the owners are bought by stockholders all over the US. And by now, all over the world, a lot of these big American companies are owned by stockholders in England and Germany and Saudi Arabia and Alabama. And basically, in terms of quantification, if, if Texas is hit by a, a large shock, basically half of the cost just, I won't explain quite how it quantified, but basically half of the shock is absorbed from cross ownership of asset. That's a very surprising and important finding, I think. It has made quite a big impact on people thinking in Europe, decided by the president of the ECB. I'm actually writing a paper for the EU Commission right now. This is my paper that's in 1996, so I've been preaching that point for a long time. But but it's, it's still not very well appreciated by politicians. Actually, they usually take the wrong side and want to nationalize or protect the national championship. Couldn't do anything worse. Well, unless there's some other uh, reasons why you do it outside of what I'm talking about. Right? So, in terms of how big a fraction of the shock is absorbed or insured by the fiscal federalism channel, we find about 15% which means much less than 
because some of them down that <coughs> hasn't been mentioned before here today. Now, when we look at, at European countries, maybe the only thing that stabilizes consumption and income has been that the local governments have been running deficits and bad times and surpluses and good times. But we always said, <laughs> well, there are two problems here, right? Whether politicians have the discipline to say, right? And did you ask, after the stage, actually after existing canal building that uh, Margaret Sonbach went bankrupt in the 1840s, they put headcuffs on themselves. They said, well, we instigate these balanced particles who cannot run deficits. They do, but very, very little. They have institutional advice where they doing it, put money in them. Maybe they fund in advance. But politicians have not the good signs, they don't put nearly enough in it. So, but in Europe, that was the only thing that helped smooth shots. And, uh, and of course, what happened, and that this reflection of the, of the numbers that Mark showed you, when the crisis had lasted until 1913, all the governments, main, most of the governments, either had run out of money, were afraid of running out of money, like in Scandinavia and Germany, started tightening up while the economy was still weak. So, ensuring yourself against bad shocks by saving, by government saving, is probably not going to happen. The fiscal union is probably not going to happen. We see way too much political resistance, especially in Germany, what people seem to say is very personal. Um, so what we are preaching is what our data sort of, we never set out to find this. You need cross ownership of assets. You need integration at that level if you want to private currency union. And if you look at Greece, it doesn't seem like Greece scores very high on any of these five points. Being willing to have cross ownership, having flexible prices, um, saving in advance of shocks. So if this, I can say, this doesn't change, maybe it's not a good idea for Greece to be in a currency. Of course, as a prime minister, I mean, the finance minister pointed out, it's a lot more painful to leave it than to join it. But it does seem, seem from this theory of optimal currency areas that we maybe not belong in the optimal currency area. It's also a question about how many other European countries, but right now Greece are the ones who have a problem. I'm going to raise a, a, a different dimension uh, for the crisis. Uh, we talked um, and, and the solutions to this crisis. Uh, we talked about what um, countries should optimally do, right? It's like uh, in order to mitigate effects of the vagaries of the business cycle, on economic activities, right? It's like and the benefits of different types of institutional setups, call them ex exchange rate regimes, fiscal policies, and the like because we believe that they may have aggregate and it's like benefits to the populations of those countries. And it's like, now again, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, we know that many of these uh, uh, choices that we have to make are gonna be political. And it's like, so we have to decide uh, what type of fiscal regime we enact, how much we spend, where. Uh, we have to decide what type of exchange rate regime we want. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, what's the level of the exchange regime? I mean, it's like overvalued, undervalued. I mean, it's like, and they have different implications, right? I mean, it's like, do we want a fixed or a flexible exchange regime, right? I mean, it's like, and all of those have different properties and effects and economic activities, but they are subject of political choices, right? So in the aggregate, just like the analogy of trade policy, most people think that opening up to trade with other countries is good, 
Private is increases, I mean, it's like options, right? I mean, it's like reduces like consumers, right? I mean, it's like reduces prices, increases the, the, the goods and services that supply, it's to more efficient allocation of resources. Uh, trade policy, as you know, we know in the, in the US, right? I mean, it's like and elsewhere has these traditional consequences. So the benefits and costs, right? I mean, it's like of engaging the rest of the world through trade and other means, right? I mean, it's like are not evenly distributed. So by not being evenly distributed, right, I mean, some actors, right, I mean, it's like I uh, take the lion's share of the benefits or the cost. And in the aggregate, we're better off, right? So the key element in these conditions, and this is the bottom line of what I want to explain, that uh, requires, right, I mean, that winners and losers, right, uh, CI to I come together, right, and find a compensatory mechanism, right, that prevents the losers from opposing, right, and enacting the policy that would be optimal for the aggregate. Right? And that's one of the conditions that we talked about, right? And we know that that's really hard, and it's like uh, uh, to happen. Right? And it's like, and, and I'm going to use some analogies from uh, my own research on Argentina and and, and, and some uh, anecdotes about other countries to explain uh, why some of the solutions that are purported, right? I mean, it's like to uh, help Greece and the European Monetary Union to stay alive and flow, right? I mean, it's like uh, require more than just, right? I mean, it's like a, a clever design of institutions. Right? Why that's the case? Because the clever design of institutions, right? I mean, it's like it's done in the shadow, right? I mean, political gains, uh, economic gains and losses that results from an election of the policies, right? Okay, so the, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, 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 political choices in good and bad times, right? I mean, it's a function, right? I mean, it's like of the uh, expected consequence of those policies, right? I mean, it's like on, on economic activity, right? I mean, it's like so. And, and the bottom line from this point is this, and it's like, uh, even when we find something that's mutually beneficial for uh, all the members of any of these entities, right, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, as long as we don't address, right, I mean, it's like, uh, how, I mean, it's like gains and losses are gonna be distributed, right, it's gonna be really hard to find a sustainable solution, and I'm gonna illustrate why that's the case, right? So, um, let me give you the example of fiscal policy, which is one of the, of the, of the potential solutions that the minister uh, has addressed as, as, as helping um, um, Greek and, uh, Greece endure, I mean, it's like the crisis, right? So what does this require is that the central countries in, in, in uh, um, Europe, right? I mean, it's like uh, the surplus countries in Europe transfer resources to, I mean, it's like Greece and other countries that could help them, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, sustain the level of spending that will be required to uh, help banks, I mean, it's like recapitalize and, uh, and help workers, right, I mean, receive their uh, 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 unemployment benefits and the like, right? That would be, right, I mean, like the third point, right, of what the optimal, I mean, what the uh, uh, functions of fiscal policy would be, right, this issue of redistribution, right? I mean, it's like, if we look at this in depth, right, I mean, the, in the European case, right, I mean, there's evidence, right, I mean, it's like from uh, German voters, right, I and mean, it's like that they're very sensitive, right, I mean, it's like to those transfers, right? So even if we bring right the Germans and the Greek uh, and, the, uh, and the Greeks together, I mean, and decide that we're going to ask the Germans to transfer resources to Greece through a fiscal union, right? I mean, it's like the Germans might not be willing to do that, right? So those, right? It's like why do I have to bail them out? I'm only going to bail them out to the extent that uh, bailing them out helps me. Right? I mean, it's like looking to that uh, position, right? So bailing out would be good uh, to the extent that we are a able, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, bringing those benefits back to us. There are some in Germany that more, I mean, it's like uh, thinking about uh, the, the, the spillovers, right, I mean, from stable Greece, right, we're having the rest of Europe, right? But that's not all the Germans, right, I mean, it's like all together, right? So the fiscal solution, right, that we're looking at, I mean, it's like we also have to look at the, the decision to bail out, I mean, it's like through transfer of resources from Central Europe, I mean, it's like to the southern states, to the peak states, would require to understand who the actors are, what to get to gain and lose, right, from those uh, different policies, right? So, and, and to give you an example, right, let's look at another property of the, of the, of the uh, uh, fiscal regime, which is uh, this, this issue of stabilization, right? The idea that, I mean, it's like that, that was expressed by the previous speaker, right, I mean, that you tend to save in good steps, right, I means to have resources for the bad time, right, bad times, so you can, uh, uh, right, I means like stabilize your consumption, smoothing your consumption over the business cycle, right? So what's the problem with this, this stabilization, right? I mean, it's like um, uh, unstable fiscal policies, just like uh, Ms. Uh, Mark has shown us in the Greek case and others, right? I mean, it's like what we know from, I mean, it's like uh, many developing countries as well, right? I mean, it's like unstable fiscal policies, right? I mean, are likely to exacerbate, right? I mean, it's like the boom and bust in the business cycle, right? They're not gonna, right? I mean, it's like, so if, if a country, right? I mean, it's like, is, uh, if a government is spending more in good times, right? I mean, it's like, uh, it's likely, I mean, it's like, and doesn't have access to finance, right? I mean, it's likely, right, to retrench more in bad times, right? 
So a movement along the beach sector is going to be exacerbated, right? It's like by, by, by that activity of the government, right? That's not, uh, not uh, uh, following this would be optimal policy, right? Okay, so I mean, it's like we can discuss if the ultimate policy is counter cyclical, right? I mean, saving good times to spend in bad times or acyclical, if you may, right? But again, I mean, it's like we see that countries, right? I mean, it's like despite these uh, clear incentives not to create a, a pro cyclical policies, right? That exacerbate this business cycle, make the peaks and the troughs, I mean, larger. And we know that we want to make these peaks and troughs uh, uh, larger, right? I mean, uh, wider. Uh, the consequences for many, uh, I mean, are, are, are huge, right? I mean, it's like uh, countries tend to engage right, in pro-cyclical I mean, uh, spending, right? Let me uh, uh, give you an example, right? I mean, it's like um, of, of, what, of, of what it looks like, right, in the Argentine in, across the world, right? I mean, it's like, so this uh, uh, picture, right, it looks at, at the uh, correlation, right? I mean, it's like uh, between uh, um, uh, the, the fiscal spending and output in, uh, across the world, right? So what we see here is like is that developed countries, right? I mean, it's like uh, countries with higher GDP per capita tend to be, right? I mean, it's like uh, uh, counter cyclical. Right? Okay. So what happens, right? When the economy goes under, right? It's, it's down. You have, I mean, it's like automatic stabilizers that kick in, and so the public sector, right? I mean, it's like spends more than it did before, like unemployment benefits, right? I mean, it's like and some poverty alleviation programs and so on and so forth, right? Or even in the U.S. case, like TARP and and other forms of bailouts, right? I mean, it's like, and when, it's good, when, when the economy is in good times, right, you get the opposite, right? I mean, it's like the, 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 the fiscal sector, right, takes less, and, 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 and the influence of the fiscal sector on, I mean, it's like output, right, is small, right? And, and less developed countries, right, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, tend to be more pro cyclical for different reasons, right? I mean, it's like, one of those reasons is that, I mean, it's like sometimes, I mean, the output is more volatile, right? I mean, it's like, and they're not able, right? I mean, it's like to, uh, 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 amass the resources that are necessary, right? I mean, it's like in bad times, they don't have access to credit. Some others claim that it's corruption, what might be driving this. There are different conditions that explain this, right? Let me show you, right? I mean, it's like that among, I mean, it's like the more developed countries, right? Uh, Greece tend to, to be more, I mean, it's like in this case, pro cyclical, right? Than the rest of the European Union, right? Uh, let me show you the case of Argentina, which is a highly prosecuted country, so I can illustrate this idea, I mean, it's like of, of whether, I mean, it's like a, a, a fiscal policy is such a right to these, I mean, political pull and push factors, right? Okay? So this is what, I mean, it's like uh, uh, for the last hundred years, right? I mean, it's like until 2004 is the data that I have here. I can extend it to 2014, it looks pretty much the same. What the, 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 the cyclical components, right? I mean, it's like of uh, spending, and, uh, and GDP per capita look in the Argentine case, right? And, and this is a clear example right, of cyclical behavior, right? I mean, it's like, and, and cyclical with a kick, right? I mean, it's like, so uh, when, 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 right? I mean, it's like GDP per capita in, in Argentina goes up, spending, government spending goes up more than proportional. And it's like, so a higher, right, increase. And when it goes down, it falls more, right? I mean, it's like, why? Well, Argentina doesn't have access to foreign markets, right? When they do that, when they have access in good times, right? And, and, and let me look at, at another component of, 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 of the uh, fiscal regime, right, which is really interesting, which is the one that you would expect to, I mean, have a bigger role, right, I mean, in, in bad times, right, which is social spending. This is what social spending looks right, like in the U.S., right? So in good times, right, I mean, it's like let's get them on, right, for, I mean, it's like food stamps, right, I mean, it's like and poverty alleviation programs, right, I mean, it's like and, and, and unemployment benefits and the like, right? So what you see in the U.S., I mean, with differences, right, I mean, across the, over time, right, depending on who's in power, right, but you do see, right, I mean, that, that uh, social spending and uh, uh, the business cycle don't go in the same uh, hand, hand in hand, right? Let me show you the same series for Argentina. So social spending, right? I mean, it's like, and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the business cycle, economic output, right? I mean, it's like, uh, go hand in hand. And the elasticity, right? I mean, of, of social spending uh, to output, right? It's like, it's, it's higher than one. So Argentina spends more on social policies when in good times. I mean, it's like, it spends much in bad times, right? This is by far not an optimal solution, right? And this happens, right? Under, I mean, it's like the, the government, right? I mean, it's like of, 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 of parties that, uh, whose constituents, right? I mean, it's like basically those that would benefit the most from counter cyclical policies. The parents, who are the party of labor in Argentina, and the poor. Those are the sectors that don't have access to financial markets, right? I mean, it's like to help them, I mean, it's like smoothen the consumption in bad times, right? I mean, it's like, and the parents, right? I mean, the party that should be, I mean, the most pro uh, counter cyclical of all, winds up being the most pro cyclical, right? So what explains this? 
and, and, and we develop, I mean, it's like in, 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 in research with some uh, uh, co-authors writing yeah. an explanation that's, that's basically driven by the idea that, uh, um, that uh, distribution of motivations, right, the uneven, I mean, it's like uh, um, distribution of gains and benefits from the different types of policies, in particular, right, integration with the global economy, right, or a or, or, uh, 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 big explanation of why Argentina, right, winds up uh, uh, behaving the way it does, right. So the correlated running from these, right, it's like, and if I want to show you, right, it's like, uh, uh, remember that I showed you a value for Argentina, right, it's like being very procyclical. The degree of procyclicality in Argentina is a, is a function of who's in power. What the pair is in power, the elasticity of spending, right, to output shocks, right, is, is, is uh, 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 twice, right? So, so the this is two, right, and it's like, and, and for no pair, it's basically, uh, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, possibly, but it's slightly, I mean, it's like uh, asymptotic, right? So what, what, what do we learn from this, right? So, so the idea is that when we, when we decide to join a, 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 a currency union, right, or an act that inflects a, 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 a fixed exchange rate regime, right, and it's like, or uh, 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 decide when and how to spend, right, and it's like, or where to integrate into the global economy. Uh, uh, these all, I mean, a policy that might be some optimal policy that we have, but the cost of those policies and the benefits are not even near this right? So to the extent that we cannot get, I mean, the winners and losers from these policies to come together, right, I mean, it's like under one, I mean, common compact, which was what I asked, I mean, uh, before, we're likely to get the result that we saw in the Argentine case. I mean, it's like that the fight for the redistribution of resources in the end winds up pulling, right, I mean, the countries down into a path, right, I mean, that's the one that we see in Greece altogether, right? And, and let me explain, I mean, like give you a, a couple of snippets, right, of, 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 of what look, Greece looks like, right, I mean, it's like in terms of the choice, for instance, right, I mean, it's like of the exchange rate regime, right? being part of the European Monetary Union, right? So let's look at the central government debt, I mean, to GDP in the case, right? After 99, right, you see a big jump. Right, I mean, it's like you see the biggest jump after the crisis, right? But a big jump. So that allows, right, I mean, it's like being part of the monetary union, and that's the, the, the Greek government, right, I mean, to access, right, I mean, to finance, right? That, that leads, right, I mean, to higher levels, right, I mean, it's like of government spending to GDP. Let me give you another example, right, I mean, it's like government consumption to GDP. You see the same process, right? Before the monetary union, right, I mean, it's like Greece, right, I mean, it's like uh, uh, had to collect resources domestically or leading its reputation in foreign markets, right, to, uh, in order to finance, right, its spending, right? A different example, right, I mean, it's like uh, the uh, capitalization, right, I mean, it's like of the banking sector, right, I mean, it's like another issue, right, that was not, I mean, it's like really not in here, right? Uh, but, 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 but the other element that's really important here is like, is the degree of leverage, right, I mean, it's like uh, in, in, in the Greek, the Greek economy, right? If you look up after 2000, right, I mean, it's like, Right, and it's like domestic rate to GDP, right, and it's like uh, more than double, right? And again, all these things, right, government consumption, uh, uh, high access, I mean, it's like to foreign finance, right, like, could have had a positive consequence in Greece. They could have led to more investment, right, I mean, it's like uh, better, I mean, it's like uh, social policies, education and the like, right? But they led to, I mean, it's like consumption, basically, right? So uh, when we stop, I mean, it's like the flow of capital, right, to, I mean, it's like finance that consumption, right, I mean, it's like then when we close, I mean, it's like the, 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 the water tap, I mean, and water stops uh, falling, right, then you have to contract, and this is what you observe, right? Uh, same with trade, right, I mean, it's like, so being part of the European Monetary Union had, I mean, it's like a, a big effect, right, I mean, it's like on, on Greece's trade, right, because now you no longer had to deal, right, I mean, it's like with exchange rate volatility, right, I mean, it's like, now you, you have the same exchange rate that, as, as most of your uh, trading partners, right? So that led to a hype, right, the degree of trade that, 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 that great, uh, yeah, right? Now again, look at the consequences, right? I mean, it's like integration to the European Monetary Union, right? I mean, it's like, uh, um, um, did not have much of an effect, right, on, on unemployment in Greece. This is the, the, the blue line, right? I mean, it's like the unemployment rate, I mean, remain, remain, I mean, it's like around 10, I mean, it's like percent. Not very flexible labor market, so it was not, right, I mean, as the, as the US uh, one, right? But if you look at, at, at the difference, right, I mean, it's like of, of, for different groups in, in, in Greece, and that may explain, right, the series appeal to the youth, for instance, right? They were benefiting, right? Unemployment among the youth, right, was going down, right, under the European Monetary Union, right? There were opportunities, right, I mean, it's like uh, associated with the flows of capital, right? But, 
right? It's like so unemployment rate for, for, for the youth, right? I mean, in, in the 2000 through 2010, right? It's like was dropping at a faster rate, right? I mean, than for the rest of the economy. But the youth are the ones that are suffering the most, right? And it's like from the current, and it's like a, a, a degree of, of collapse in, in, in the Greek economy. So that tells you, right? I mean, it's like that when you think about the solutions to these issues, right? I mean, it's like in the Greek case, just as we saw in the Argentine case, you have to identify, right? I mean, it's like who the winners and losers might be, right? I mean, from these policies, right? So the bottom line, right? I mean, it's like is that the policies that governments enact before and after, right? I mean, it's like a shock or a collapse. Are likely to be reflecting, right? I mean, policy choices that are, that are derived, right? I mean, from the, I mean, it's like the preference of different actors in terms of how they fare, right? I mean, it's like in different types of, of, of economic regimes. That's the, 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 the bottom that I want to bring to your attention. So we look at solutions, right? I mean, it's like that might be optimal for the country as a whole. We have to think about those solutions, right? I mean, as being politically feasible. Right? And that side of the debate I haven't seen, right? And it's like uh, in, 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 the, in the crisis that we are observing in Greece and the rest of Europe. Thank you. Just to highlight three main elements that uh, uh, exude from the presentation made by the Minister of Finance from Greece. And I think that you will agree with me that, first of all, uh, Greece uh, seemed to be prepared to join the European Union back in 2001. The, even though it uh, may have fulfilled the criteria for joining it, uh, in the end, it has. The Greek economy had structural complexities that were uh, completely different to the already uh, existing national members of the, of the European Union. Um, and to that effect, uh, we have, you would like to argue that both politicians and the government were doing not uh, assess uh, fully and thoroughly the, fact, the fundamental fact in or rule of thumb in the original economic integration, which is trade creation being larger or equal to trade diversion. A second is uh, is the uh, I think that I perhaps I am reading between lines or being the, uh, underneath the water, but uh, there seems to be some discontent in his speech to say, and this is something that I share. That they might have, been, they, they might be a, from the European Union um, perspective, some degree of bias, negative bias towards the how they are dealing with the situation in Greece, as compared to how they dealt uh, with the one faced by Spain and Portugal. They have been much more uh, uh, tougher, much more uh, harsh, and stringent on uh, on the. The economic, on the policy instruments and the, the, the ways they are trying to enforce uh, bringing back the Greek economy to to to, the, to fulfill or to, to be at the level of other uh, um, other economies members uh, member of the European Union uh, as they, they were uh, for other nations um, that faced the crisis, crisis uh, situations in the past. Um, the the third uh, element that I would like to also mention is the fact that um, uh, now Greece has has to face or is being debating uh, quite in, in, intensively as to whether or not to remain or to leave uh, the European Union. This is a fundamental. Uh, uh, question, uh, it entails 
as only an, an, an infinite number of, of issues that that goes in, in terms of the pros and cons as to whether or not we should remain as a member. Um, the, the, the political, the economic uh, implications are such that uh, either way um, it, will, it, will, it will be a burden for the other uh, members of the, of the, of the EU or um, the Greece as itself is going to face uh, an enormous uh, uh, challenge in terms of building up an economy that's purely based on services, nothing else. Uh, the manufacturing uh, is not there. Uh, it has a, it has a, it has a, a very small component of basic uh, agriculture, uh, as, as, and so the only sector, uh, the only industry within the service sector is nothing else than tourism. So um, it, I, 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 it is uh, um, with. Uh, I am sympathetic about this situation that Greece is facing, uh, and I hope that we can uh, enlighten the discussion later on uh, as to making comparison with what we have seen in, in countries like Argentina or some other parts of some other uh, case studies around the world as to whether or not we can take examples uh, that, and that will enable us to come up with uh, uh, solutions. If we can, if we can, we are, we can be uh, uh, as optimistic like that for the Greece case. Okay, thanks. Thank you to all our panelists. We're now going to take a, a quick uh, five-minute break or so. We can grab some coffee if you need to use the restroom. Please do so. And when we come back, we're going to finish playing the minister's remarks, and then we'll bring the panel up to take questions from the audience to discuss the middle of remarks or any questions that you may have. So, have, grab some coffee and take a Demonstrate that they know those policies don't work. Okay, well, again, just before I answer, let me repeat the disclaimer I issued <laughs> before I <laughs> made my remarks, okay? So that's on the record. Um, I, I think in, in these negotiations, my understanding is that in these negotiations, the IMF is actually more uh, flexible of, of, of the so-called troika that Greece is dealing with. The IMF is arguably the most flexible agency involved and that the real inflexibility is not coming from the IMF because the IMF has extensive experience with these programs uh, not just in Europe but around the world and I think they've learned a lot from their experience about what works and what doesn't work. They may not have always gotten it right but they're in this business, they've been in this business for a long time and my impression again as, as an outsider is that the IMF is actually a somewhat more flexible and that the less flexible partners are based in Europe, not Washington. Um, how you deal with, I mean, ar arguably some of these problems could have been avoided from the outset by allowing a complete default and that was ruled out. I mean, this also, this didn't apply just to Greece but also to the other countries that got into trouble. There was this issue that sovereign debt should be considered sacrosanct within the euro area and that the ECB in particular did not want to see any sovereigns defaulting on their debt because that would then raise a whole host of financial stability issues. And again, I think when the history of this episode is written, um, you know, the, maybe the ECB will, you know, rethink its position on these things, but arguably a lot of what Greece has had to go through, what Ireland had to go through, what Spain and Portugal had to go through could have been avoided if you had sovereign defaults. But I think the ECB arguably legitimately was concerned about if you did have sovereign defaults that that would have enormous spillover effects to the rest of the euro area, which might have been hard to control. And I, I, you know, if you put yourself in uh, President Trichet's shoes, you know, you probably would have made the same call yourself because these calls were made at a time when the global economy was at its most fragile uh, state that it has been in since the Great Depression. And the last thing the global economy needed was a major shock in the second most powerful economic region in the world. But in hindsight, you know, lots of things look different in hindsight, but you know, that, that, that would be my take. Any other questions? Okay, well, 
Hi, uh, my name is Alex Kalamaridis, and the question is I'd like uh, you to comment a little bit more on the road ahead. What are the potential outcomes from this impasse for Greece? How does Greece move forward? What are the different scenarios? And what are your thoughts as to the pros and cons of the different scenarios? Is that to me Pitman as far as? Or does anybody get No. It is very hard to see a way out for the Greeks with the current debt level. I mean, it, unless some growth miracle occurs, um, it's very difficult to see how you grow your way out from a debt burden of 180% of GDP. It's not unprecedented. It has happened. The United Kingdom, after the Napoleonic Wars, had a debt-to-GDP ratio in excess of 200% of GDP. They grew out from under that without ever defaulting. But that was in a very different economic and political circumstances where you did not have large claims on the public purse for social programs. That's the big difference between the UK and the 19th century, when the UK was the most powerful country in the world on the gold standard. Most public spending was on defense. There was, you, you didn't have to have a, support a big welfare state, so it was feasible to actually run down a debt like that. So it has happened, but the lessons you can draw from that experience are limited. I think in, the, in a modern uh, liberal democracy, where you have a lot of demands on the public purse, it's hard to see how you uh, grow out from under that kind of a debt without some kind of restructuring like the minister talked about. Um, but y you know, how, how exactly you do that in a manner that's palatable to the... Because this means that the taxpayers in the rest of Europe take a hit if you restructure. I mean, let's be honest about this. A restructuring is a default by another name. It means basically that you're you're putting a hit on the taxpayers in not just Germany, not just the Netherlands, not just Finland, but also countries like Ireland, Portugal, Spain that also had to go through their own austerity programs and dealt with it without a default. And that's the big political challenge I think the current Greek government faces is selling a program like this to the electorates in these other peripheral European countries. It's not just the Germans have a say in this, obviously they're the most important, but it's also these other countries that dealt with so-called austerity programs. Can I, can I take the last part? I mean, it's like a, a part of learning. So um, we, we do think that we learn from the past. I mean, but we have very short memories. Right? I mean, it's like an, uh, as political actors and financial actors as well. But right? I mean, so countries right, that default, right, I mean, it's like take a hit. I mean, it's like when they try to I mean, float debt immediately after that. But I mean, it's like uh, when there's excess, I mean, it's like uh, um, uh, um, uh, money floating around, they can access those markets again, right? and things start over as if nothing happened. Right? And I'll bring back the example of Argentina. Right? I mean, it's like we got burned in 2001. Right? I mean, it's like uh, uh, for pursuing those unsustainable policies. Right? I mean, it's like, and, and we would have expect to learn. We have the same actors in power since then, and we're back to where we're at before. Right? I mean, it's like so. The point you make about the, the Latin Monetary Union, right? it's like, is well taken. The idea, um, uh, the, the, the gold standard also worked, I mean, it's like in a broader sense, right? I mean, it's like in many countries in different I mean, uh, times. The issue is, right, in order to follow, I mean, this strict, I mean, it's like an uh, uh, um, inflexible, I mean, it's like exchange rate regimes, you have to be willing, I mean, it's like to adjust your, I mean, it's like fiscal and other forms of policy, right? I mean, it's like uh, to sustain uh, that bet. I mean, and usually for different reasons, uh, countries uh, are forced out of it altogether. At times they re back as they did in the 20s, right? I mean, late 20s, early 30s, right? I mean, many countries, right? I mean, it's like uh, 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 moved out of the, of the, of the uh, gold standard and went back to it, right? I mean, it's like, and something that, I mean, it's like, with, I mean, it's like uh, a lot of uh, um, harm to, I mean, some vulnerable sectors of, the, of their economies. But as, as, as Mark mentioned early on, 
uh, in, in modern, I mean, it's like uh, democracies that we have, the demands of the public sector are so strong that this hardship sometimes is really uh, uh, difficult to uh, support. So uh, I'll just add to that and, and to elaborate on a point I already made. So the Latin Monetary Union was sort of a, a, an arrangement within the old gold standard, the classical gold standard system. Um, and the key to the gold standard was you had this ironclad rule that you had to maintain convertibility of your currency into precious metals, uh, which limited the ability of monetary policy to be used for stabilizing economic activity or dealing with bank runs. Um, and the gold standard actually functioned reasonably well up until the outbreak of World War I. There were occasional suspensions to deal with wars and things like that, but typically countries went back uh, to convertibility after those temporary suspensions. When the country, when you know the the Western Europe and other countries tried to go back on the gold standard after the First World War, it became more difficult because what had happened during the war was extension of the franchise, and suddenly there was uh, greater demands on the public purse. There was you know people expected um, uh, 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 larger social programs, and they expected the government to play a role in stabilizing economic activity. And both of those things were very difficult to do under a very rigid rule like the gold standard. And so, again, the Latin Monetary Union was just a variant or subspecies of the gold standard, and ultimately it was incompatible with these, the changing political reality that had emerged in the 1920s. Um, and, and very rigid system, and this is part of the problem, I think, when you have a very rigid system, if, you know, you can live, so within the United States, we manage okay with these very rigid, we've much more rigid budget rules at the state level, but it's within the context of a banking union, a fiscal union, and added, you know, in, uh, interstate mobility, and plus the points that Bent has talked about, about where we have this pooling of risks, we don't have home bias, where all of our investments in taxes, all our savings in taxes are invested in taxes. I mean, the gold standard was a period where you had much more flexible prices and wages. Right. At the same time as you had uh, quite massive immigration. Now, the, the the Prime Minister, I mean, the finance man got a little bit wrong. The, the theory of optimal currency doesn't tell you what you should do. It lists five criteria, and it says if none of these holds, it can be costly to be in a currency union. It only doesn't tell you how you get out of the trouble that Greece are in currently. I have nothing to say about that. That's a very complicated political knot. And one extra point to that is that uh, the, the minister uh, showed us, and we can look in the data, that prices in, in Greece, right, I mean, it's like, and wages have dropped dramatically, right? I mean, it's like, precisely because you're, I mean, it's like getting, right, the shackles from, right? I mean, it's like the, the bind to the euro. Right? I mean, it's like the only way for the real exchange rate, I mean, it's like, uh, of Greece to become, I mean, it's like, I think at competitive uh, uh, level is, I mean, it's like, to, I mean, it's like lower prices. And this is what you see. I mean, the, the pain is already being felt by, 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 the, by the Greeks, right? Um, the minister kept uh, mentioning America as an example, but uh, he didn't mention taxation at all. And if, if Europe is to have uh, a unified taxation entity, how, how would that happen? Sorry, what's the question? I can actually to, to take that, that one, uh, if you don't mind. So my, my area of research primarily is um, uh, the politics of the European Union. And this is one of the big holes in, in the European Union, why the European Union doesn't work like a federal country, right? So we have a lot of different parts of, quote unquote, federalism in the European Union. But the one thing that we don't have is any European-wide tax. And there's some European VAT, uh, VAT, that's, you know, um, that's sort of standardized. But there's no such thing as a European income tax. There's no such thing as, there, there's, none of, there's not that, that primary mechanism to take wealth from one part of the Eurozone and transfer it to another, as there is in the US, right, where we have a federal income tax, places with more wealth, people pay more tax, and then that gets redistributed through Social Security or, or uh, other companies programs, right? Uh, and that doesn't exist. Um, and it's also not likely to exist anytime uh, soon, right? Um, I, you know, it, it's, that's one of the, the 
the, the thorniest questions in, and has been for a long time of European politics. Um, and so we don't have that mechanism for fiscal redistribution in Europe that we do in, in the US. Let, let me add one point to this. Uh, so we had, a, I mean, it's like a, an election a few years ago in this country, right, where even within a country that has, I mean, it's like uh, unified fiscal institutions, right, I mean, we had the debate between takers, right, I mean, it's like, and, right, I mean, it's like, and, and those that contribute, right, I mean, so we have the same issue in Europe, even if we had a fiscal, I mean, it's like union, right, I mean, it's like, even if you had the resources, right, you would face the same conditions at play. When you have, for instance, the Germans, right, who are the surplus side, are not willing, right, I mean, to support, I mean, it's like a, a, a big bailout, I mean, it's like, unless, right, I mean, it's like it has a spillover over their own activity, right? There's evidence for that. I mean, it's like some of our colleagues have been looking at these uh, through surveys, right? I mean, it's like, and you observe, right? I mean, it's like that the, uh, the most of the support for bailing out Greece, right, I mean, in 2010 in Germany came from uh, uh, financial asset holders in Germany, right? So those, I mean, with this story, they want to send their money back to Greece because they want to recover their losses, right? And have the rest of the German population pay, pay for those, right? But there's sensitivity among the Germans, right? I mean, about the size of the packages. So when asked about the different levels of the package that Germany has to contribute, right, to bail out different countries, including Greece, right? When, when the number becomes extremely big, I mean, it's like there's a backlash and a sizable one, and, and there's no longer support. So even if we had the instruments, right, I mean, to collect the resources from the Germans, to transfer them right, I mean, to the poorer regions in, in the country, you'd still see, right, I mean, it's like these political tensions at play. I think there's, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I would say, like, in, in principle, the, the bailout is an insurance system. The FDIC, you, you pay an insurance, right? And in principle, you could build up these things in Europe. In principle, you could have a joint retirement system. I think the question is one of trust. Like, there are two big differences between countries that speak different languages. They don't trust each other not to game the system. I believe that's the main hurdle in the end. I mean, I think there's two dimensions, too, to having a fiscal union. You can think of a fiscal union as a, a way of pooling localized risks so that, you know, when Texas had its bust in the 1980s, we received transfers from the rest of the country that helped smooth out the, that bust. And likewise, when we're doing well, but Michigan's in trouble, we're making transfers to Michigan. But those are tra temporary transfers. It's just like a big insurance pool. And I think that's an easier proposition to sell than something like a permanent transfer union such as exists between northern and southern Italy. And that's where I think the Germans get really, really upset. Um, and I think the minister's reference to Greece as a deficit country is problematic in that regard. It's sort of insinuating that there's a permanent flow into these countries. I mean, countries are not deficit countries. You're deficit because you make certain choices with your public finances. And that's not, you know, I, I can see why people might be unwilling to sign up to a permanent arrangement where you're just permanently making transfer payments, such as those that w exist within, say, the Italian uh, uh, state. Uh, <coughs> this is not a question, really. Uh, well, let's, 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 we're talking about the taxation, uh, European taxation. Mm -hmm. So on this subject, uh, I think this is not uh, an economist that speaks, uh, let us say, they use the wisdom on the street. Uh, I think the European taxation is not imposed there because uh, there is a Germany in 1945 is just starving and there is uh, money that comes from the West, either London or New York, and bails the Germany out. When someone finances someone, their Germany owns the country. So Germany is not really the Germany we are talking about. It is just a little shop of the banks of the West. Now, Germany is the bully guy that speaks for other guys in Europe. If we had a taxation, we would have also an army in Europe, and that is against NATO. Things, they get complicated, and that is interest uh, that they protect banks again. Uh, this kind of union in Europe and taxation in Europe, I think it cannot be possible at least for the moment. I'm going to have to ask you to, 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 to end there, because we do only have a few minutes left, and I'm going to take one more question. Yeah, you don't want to hear that. I have a question. Um, I haven't heard the word of VIX yet. Uh, you said we have a lot of you know, Greeks and Greek Americans here who do help our family back in Greece. What is the role of remittances played in the Greek economy in terms of helping them in that, I guess, what they call supply side? 
Um, my understanding is that it, it's, it's relatively small. I mean, obviously, the importance of remittances depends on how big your diaspora is, and then also relative income levels and things like that. I, I don't have an exact number. I actually wrote a, a piece recently for one of our bank publications looking at remittances as one of the ways in which the losses that occur as a result of out-migration can be mitigated for the home, home country from which migrants come. And certainly, Greece would not be up there with the, the, in terms of the, the countries for which remittances loom large in their GDP. It's usually very small, very poor countries with huge numbers, of, like the Philippines, for example, where you have very, very large numbers of Filipinos living outside of the Philippines, sending a lot of money back to a very poor country. Uh, even for, for Mexico, it, it's important, but not as large as you might think, given how big the Mexican diaspora is in the United States. But it's mainly for really small countries. It obviously helps, but it, I, I think given Greece is still a pretty big economy, and I, I don't know that the size yeah. of the expatriate Greek community is large enough to provide a huge offset to, given the scale of the shock I showed you that they're, I mean, they're dealing with a Great Depression-like event. And I don't think there's any remittance flow in the world that can offset something like that. It, it, it is an offsetting mechanism, but it's tiny. I have a student working on this. Like in Kyrgyzstan, where yeah. half the population are working away, you get bang for the buck. But otherwise, I mean, you really got to get to something like that before it's an important mechanism. But it is a mechanism. I could right. have mentioned it, but it's tiny in usual case. One or two more questions. Are there any more? Um, sure. I will once again just to add a little bit of the geopolitical angle. When I was looking at the charts that uh, Dr. Wynne, you put on the board, you were showing, of course, the numbers of Greece as me being the most egregious outlier in the Eurozone, which of course begs the question why was it permitted in the first place? A traditional reply to that question has to do with geopolitics, the importance of Greece's position in that part of the world. That, in my mind, perhaps makes the analogy between Greece and Argentina even closer than we like to think in terms of origins, meaning that the commodity aspect of the Argentinian, Argentinian economy may have been mirrored in historical times to some extent by the geopolitical advantage of Greece as being partly the recipient of largesse in the form of Marshall, for example, planned after the war or at other times. My question then becomes how far can this analogy be taken? And can, in some way, the geopolitical advantage of Greece, fluctuating as it may be over time in the world scene, be used as, as some sort of a resource for the country? Um, so I, I, I think the geopolitical angle is actually hugely important. And I think. Um, Greece, the Euro Greece's European partners are well aware of this. Greece is a pivotal member of NATO. Um, it, it, it's in a very unstable region. And I, I think when push comes to shove, I think everybody understands this. But these are political factors that are certainly beyond my expertise. Um, the other thing is, I think in these negotiations, so uh, Martin Wolf, who writes for the, um, the Financial Times uh, has written a lot about the Euro crisis. Uh, one of his recent columns, um, he noted that the second worst idea that European politicians have ever had was to launch the Euro. The worst idea they could ever have would be to disband the whole thing. Well, this means that in its negotiations with its European partners, Greece is not without cards because a Greek exit of any sort would be enormously disruptive. I think we've seen a lot of commentary in the media recently that we're now, because all of the debt is held by official institutions as opposed to uh, private institutions, that contagion would be minimal. But I think were Greece to leave under either voluntarily or involuntarily from the monetary union, it would fundamentally change everybody's perception of the euro, and that then there will be no going back. Just as the minister said, there's no going back to you know having the path that took Greece to where it is today. That's just it, it, you cannot unwind that that reel. So Greece is sort of, and that sort of feeds into the geopolitical things. The other thing is the geopolitical thing is probably a burden for Greece too, when you consider how big the defense budget is for Greece. I mean, it, to me, it was surprising. I was doing some research recently to learn that. The Greek Air Force is about the same size as the Royal Air Force of the United Kingdom. 
And for a country its size, it sort of doesn't really make sense for a country of maybe, what, 10 million people to be maintaining that kind of combat capability. But then when you understand the region of the world in which they're located, suddenly things change. But that is an enormous burden on the public finances to be maintaining that kind of defense spending. Um, So, well, the, there's two things. We can talk about the recent financial crisis or the specifics of, what, say, what happened in Nevada or uh, Texas. And I think that, that the, illusion, the relevant analogy is with Nevada or Texas. Nevada recently or Texas in the 1980s, because those are both examples of where having the fiscal union helped smooth out the, lo the severity of the local shock. The 1980s in Texas was pretty traumatic. It would have been a darn sight worse had the entire burden of that fallen on the state of Texas instead of being shared by the rest of the United States. Likewise, the problems of Michigan went with the collapse of the car industry would have been a lot worse for Michigan. It was pretty bad. Uh, it still is bad. But again, it would have been a lot worse absent the transfers Michigan receives from New York, California, Texas as they deal with that adjustment. The recent financial crisis, Lehman Brothers, the bailouts, TARP, and so on, that, that's a sort of a separate issue. And there's not, I mean, one can debate the merits of that. The relevance for the Greek experience are a little bit different. There are concerns that political systems are set up to overly favor bankers as opposed to the ordinary person. Yeah, and I, I, I think one could have a, a good discussion on that. And So I had a student <laughs> working on, on, on bailouts in general, not only on finance, and, and there are two things that stand out. I mean, it's like for this, one is, I mean, it's like uh, political mobilization of the group. And, the higher uh, concentrated the benefit or losses, the more likely they are uh, to be influential. The financial industry in the U.S. is one of those examples. And so they, they tend to, I mean, it's like favor where other, I mean, it's like industries in distress. Uh, th that's one dimension. The second one is how, I mean, it's like uh, the sector, right, I mean, it's like has spillover over, I mean, it's like other sectors of the economy and other regions of the country. And, and, and that's what could explain, right, for instance, the bailout of the auto industry in the U.S. and a few others, I mean, it's like uh, in like uh, the transportation industry after 9-11, and so on and so forth, right, with the, air, I mean, the, the airplane industry, and so on and so forth. The mechanisms through which, I mean, the bailouts occur are different, right? I mean, it's like in some, they, they lead to consolidation. Uh, I'm surprised by the economy, because I, I don't think the union actually became stronger as a result of that process. I think that's more of a misconception. Maybe not his part. I'm not sure. But the main point is that these institutions are not Nevada institutions. The main point is that diversified ownership in the U.S. That my research have shown many times. Lehman was not a Nevada bank. Maybe we just let Nevada flow. Right? The, the stock owners at Bank of America and Citibank are all over the U.S. It was not a region bailing out another region, which gives another dimension, right? It's like, oh, these are these guys benefiting from us. Was, you know, it's an integrated economic system in the U.S. to a much higher extent than in Europe. No, I, mean, I, I actually, I, I'm very sympathetic with your point. I mean, the, the, having financial institutions that are considered too big to fail or having any kind of an entity within a capitalist system that is viewed as too big to fail and must be bailed out by the government when it gets into distress is extremely problematic. And certainly my boss, my bank, has taken a very strong position on this that it's an anathema to capitalism, as we understand it, to allow institutions to exist that, that profit on the upside and then on the downside they're bailed out by taxpayers. So I, I think, cert I know the institution for which I work has been very sympathetic to the view that we need to get rid of or address the too big to fail problem within the banking system because it is perceived as 
basically giving bankers profits on the upside and then the taxpayers take the hit on the downside. And that is just fundamentally incompatible with the principles of capitalism. How you design an alternative system, again, we could spend another afternoon here. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's end there. Thank you very much to our panelists. I know Mr. Ren has back to the airport. Thank you so much for everybody who's coming out on a, on a beautiful afternoon. Thank you to Manos for putting all of this together. And, and to well, you did well. Could you have a little bit of more knowledge about this?